Alyssa, thank you so much for coming on to this podcast slash YouTube, wherever you're viewing or listening to this. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to have a great interview with Alyssa today. Um, she is another physical therapist out of Utah. So I'm going to let her um, introduce herself a little bit more with just kind of your own story and what got you into physical therapy. Um, and if, if you don't already follow Alyssa on YouTube, you definitely should because she posts some really good workout videos. So I do also want you to tell us um, how you stay in such great shape because it's clear that you work out and I want to know what you're doing. Yes. So thanks for having me. So I am actually a recent Midwest transplant. We moved to Utah in May of 2020. So we're kind of just getting used to the outdoor lifestyle and everything, hiking, biking. There's lots of adventure out here. And so I began my business out here called Keep the Adventure Alive. And it mainly started targeting people that have osteoarthritis because I used to do home care physical therapy, seeing people in their homes after hospitalizations or after an injury. And many times I found that when people were diagnosed with arthritis, there was kind of a mindset shift of my life is over. I can never do the things that I love again. I can never, I can't grow up with my grandkids. I'm so limited and there's nothing I can do. And so we've kind of adopted that mindset and it's, I've taken my passion into a mission of showing people that you can have an adventure with osteoarthritis. It's not necessarily, there's nothing I can do. I just have to get surgery. Surgery isn't even inevitable. And a lot of people do think that. And so I've been kind of running with that idea and working with people here in Utah in their homes, people that have had chronic pain without even a diagnosis of osteoarthritis or people that have been diagnosed with arthritis and are kind of trying to figure out how to deal with that pain and how to remain skiing, cycling, hiking, mountain biking, all of those things. So that's been great since I've been here in Utah. I also do have a YouTube channel like Morgan mentioned, um, going along those same lines, helping people at home with managing osteoarthritis. And so this kind of stemmed from the whole COVID quarantine thing. And so many times people were either relying on their gym, relying on their personal trainers, whatever your exercise program was, now you're at home with no kind of um, estimation of when this is going to end. So I wanted to help people get used to working out at home. So we don't have this disruption anymore. And so you know what you can do at home. And so that is all on my YouTube channel and how I stay in shape. So I definitely like to practice what I preach. If I'm going to be telling you to work out, I'm going to be working out too. So I do CrossFit. I've been doing CrossFit for about five years now, and I am a CrossFit level one certified instructor. So I also have been leading a master's class kind of in the past couple of weeks, helping people 50 and up with CrossFit. And so I typically do CrossFit. I also do some outdoor activities. We've been hiking, road biking. We're going to get into downhill skiing, potentially cross country skiing. So I'm always doing something. I at least do something every day as far as working out at least an hour, because like I said, I like to practice what I preach. And so that's kind of the long winded story <laughs> of keep the adventure alive and kind of here in Utah. I like long winded stories. I did. Like <laughs> you didn't know I was going to ask this, but creating a YouTube channel is such a weird thing. And I had no video experience. I had no tech experience. Did you have any sort of video tech microphone audio experience because your videos are great and if you haven't already watched them you definitely should and it is so much harder than people would think to even like make a video and let alone get it up on the internet so how did you kind of figure all that out 
So honestly, just a lot of trial and error. And it's funny because if you look at my older YouTube videos, like when I first started, they're like fringe worthy now. <laughs> um, but it's all kind of trial and error. And I think a lot of people try to make it much more complicated than it really is. I mean, I use my phone for um, my video. I use, I do use a microphone for that I found on Amazon for the audio when it's really far away. If I'm just kind of talking like this, I don't typically use it, but and that was just, you know, found from some recommendations and things. So, I mean, it's been trial and error and it's, I'm still working on fixing some things and, but I mean, it's definitely a work in progress, but the information is there and the value is there. And so even, I mean, I don't think people actually care too much about the quality of it and making sure it's perfect. I mean, the, like I said, the quality and value is there. And I think that's the most important part. And so I think people focus too much on the aesthetics of it and not so much on the, then you kind of lose the value of it. So for me, it's just kind of putting it out there and seeing who will watch. Yeah. And I know I kind of wanted to dig into your business a little bit more just so that people listening or watching have a better understanding about what you offer. So I know you have a private Facebook group that's free and you're really active in there. And is that for people who have osteoarthritis? So the group is called keeping your adventure alive with osteoarthritis, but you don't necessarily have to have a diagnosis per se, because there are some other things that kind of can be thrown in there, like chronic pain. Even if you don't have a diagnosis of osteoarthritis, I mean, if you're having chronic knee pain that just isn't going away, chronic hip pain, back pain, shoulder pain, those kind of fall into it too. And so I have people kind of all across the board, some that have arthritis and some that are just dealing with aches and pains and things and might not have that diagnosis, but yes, it's free. So it's keeping the adventure alive with osteoarthritis. And I post lots of exercise ideas. I post lots of tips and tricks, products that people might use for pain relief, all sorts of things. And we actually have really good engagement. And so I think that's the biggest thing is when you can kind of collaborate with other people that have arthritis. So I, cause I obviously don't, but I also have, you know, the experience of working with people with arthritis, but we also get help from our members. So if people have tried something like, for example, for hand osteoarthritis, it's very common in that group. And we've been using and um, recommending the compression gloves. And so then I had a, quite a few people, oh, I've used these before and they've helped and all those things. So that kind of helps as well, kind of validate some of those product recommendations. And I always ask, you know, is anybody using something that they've had luck with? Or maybe I've tried something that they hadn't had luck with. And so it's definitely a collaborative thing as well, because with osteoarthritis and chronic pain, I mean, you need that continued support. And that's what I am trying to provide in this group. Mm -hmm. I think that's awesome. And then right now you're doing one-on-one -on -one stuff in Utah. Are you able to do any virtual visits or what's your, I guess, especially with COVID right now. So what's kind of your treatment? Yeah. So I do, um, in home, like you said, here in Utah. So I go to people's homes and do one-on-one. -on -one. I also do some virtual sessions, which actually work great with osteoarthritis because it's not necessarily too much of a hands-on thing. It's a lot. I take the approach of really using movement to empower people because I want to give you the resources. I don't want you to have to rely on me for massage and those types of things for pain relief. I want you to get pain relief on your own. That's the ultimate goal. And so, yes, I do also have an option for virtual visits. So I am licensed in Utah, Michigan, and Ohio. And so if you reside in any of those states, I can do a virtual visit as well. There are some people that, you know, even still in Utah, don't want me to come to their homes with health issues and things like that. So virtual is definitely an option and it's definitely a growing option. There's tons and tons of people getting into telehealth and because we never know when we're going to go on quarantine again. And so, yes, that is absolutely an option. And I'm also developing some online resources for people, because if you're not in one of those states, I still want to help you. And so I have some home exercise programs. I just rolled out a knee osteoarthritis home exercise program. That's eight weeks. It just walks you through five days a week of just a workout. That's going to be 10 to 20 minutes. It's not going to be your full day. 
And so that's going to be rolled out. I'm also rolling out hip and low back and kind of working up the body and then adding in the shoulder. And so those are going to be super affordable, but just offering as a way that you can keep moving when you're at home. And so you don't have to feel lost when you're trying to scour Google or scour YouTube for some workouts and then you start doing it and then you have pain and then you get frustrated. And so these are kind of proven methods that I've used with my clients that haven't flared up their pain and have dramatically helped their quality of life and being able to get their confidence back. So I have one of those for every body part as well. That's amazing. That's a lot of work too, for those <laughs> just yes. to program together. So we will be sure to link to your YouTube channel and your website. So if people want to learn more about you or your services, those will all be in the show notes um, or the YouTube description. And I feel like you are such an expert in the area of osteoarthritis. I think when you tend to niche down, you know so much more about the area than like the average physical therapist. Yes. Like, I know so much more about weight loss than the average physical therapist. Cause that's my niche. You know, so much more about osteoarthritis than even I do as a geriatric, you know, clinical specialist. So I really want to dig your brain here as to what are some of the biggest myths that you've encountered regarding osteoarthritis and, and its typical progression. Yes. So this is a huge one. And the most important one, because we have to kind of get past these myths in order to start exercising and start realizing how these things can help. And so one of the biggest myths about osteoarthritis is that it's caused from wear and tear. So running too much when you were younger, having a manual labor job, etc. So many times when we think that osteoarthritis is wear and tear, it scares us from further movement. So if you think that osteoarthritis was caused because you were running too much when you were younger, now you then are scared because if you think that the cartilage is wearing away because of too much activity, then when you hear that diagnosis of osteoarthritis, then you think it's caused by activity. And so we limit our activity. And so that is kind of one of the biggest myths is that osteoarthritis is not caused by wear and tear. So the problem is when it starts to happen is when we're moving incorrectly, we start to form these bone lesions, which can lead to pain. And so this can kind of be tied into a little bit of that wear and tear, but we have to make sure that we're moving correctly. And so another huge piece of this is the inflammatory aspect. And so we actually have triggers in our body that trigger this inflammatory process. And then when this process is triggered, then these inflammatory cells come in and kind of wreak havoc on our cartilage and all of those things. Now, these triggers are a lot of where you come in as well, because it's obesity, it's diet. It's the type of exercise you're doing. If you're more sedentary, you have more inflammatory cells. If you're, if you have a lot more body fat, you have more inflammatory cells, a previous injury. So if you've had, take the knee, for example, if you've had an ACL, MCL, any types of those surgeries that can predispose you to osteoarthritis. And there's a couple of other things, but one of the biggest things are just lifestyle changes. And so many times, if we just make simple lifestyle changes, we can decrease that quantity of inflammatory cells, but we have to get past that wear and tear first, because if we continue to think wear and tear, then you're not going to want to move because you think that it's harming your joint further. Now, another myth about osteoarthritis is the fact that there's nothing we can do about it. So yes, I agree that we cannot necessarily regenerate cartilage. We cannot grow new cartilage, but we can strengthen the cartilage we have. So one of the things, if you do start to lose a little bit of cartilage with your arthritis, so if you see an x-ray or you have a doctor tell you that you're bone on bone, that sort of thing, you can help that. And so it's been found that actually movement in the right amount and type of physical activity can help actually regenerate and can help 
build more. It's called proteoglycan, but it's a aspect of your cartilage. It's what your cartilage is made out of. And so it's been shown through research that through appropriate physical activity, you can actually continue to build that proteoglycan content. So it's stronger. And when that's stronger, it's not going to irritate those bones as much and cause pain. So movement is definitely one of the greatest things for arthritis. Now, if you're thinking about your cartilage, so it's actually been shown that inadequate loading. So if we completely stop physical activity and we are scared to kind of stand on our knees or put pressure on our knees or our hips or bend at our low back, that has been shown to actually increase cartilage degradation. So your cartilage then progresses its damage faster. But one of the things you can do to um, combat that is doing more strength training and doing more loading to those joints. So definitely we cannot rule out physical activity because unfortunately it's one of the first things that go and we cannot rule that out. And I cannot be more explicit about this and I cannot be more forward about this. You cannot stop moving. And so that is another thing. Now, the third one is just bone on bone. So I hear this all the time that people have pain and their pain is caused by being bone on bone. This is what we develop into that mindset of there's nothing I can do about it. I'm bone on bone. I just have to kind of deal with it. But actually pain is not caused by being directly bone on bone because I've had a lot of people who have been bone on bone and haven't had any pain. You hear kind of that noise of um, your bones kind of moving sometimes, um, especially as we get older, but they don't necessarily have pain. They kind of have that creaking, crackling, but they don't have any pain. And if you look at their x-rays, they're bone on bone like most people are with arthritis, but they don't have pain. And so then it's, how do we explain this? What is, what is the difference between the people that have pain and the people that don't? So there's been tons of studies where they've taken x-rays of both people, people that have pain and people that don't, and their x-rays look ultimately the same. This was primarily done in knee, but it's also in hip and low back as well. So then we kind of start to think about why they have pain, what differentiates them. And that's that inflammatory cell process. So the people that have pain are usually more obese. They have more body fat. They are less active. They have a diet high in anti in inflammatory foods or just poor eating habits. A lot of it is, are these lifestyle changes. Now, again, it's if you've had a previous knee injury or those sorts of things, genetics also plays a huge role. And so sometimes, I mean, you obviously can't control for genetics, but you can control for these lifestyle factors. And so these then play a part into pain. So being bone on bone does not necessarily mean you're going to have pain. There's lots of other things that goes into it. And so don't think of bone on, if you're told that you're bone on bone, don't think my life's over. There's nothing I can do about it. There are things that we can do about it. And there are simple changes we can make. And Morgan definitely helps with the weight loss, the diet, cleaning up your foods, all of those things that play a huge part. And then I pick up the movement and, and really help to show you that you can actually move. I want to unpack a couple of the things that you said. So proteoglycans, which is a really cool word. <laughs> I've come across it in years and I'm surprised I even remember how to say it. Yeah. So you said that exercise can help specifically strength training and loading. Now mm -hmm. I want you to, to describe a little bit more about what you specifically mean when you say strength training and loading, because for people, um, I feel like in the age range where we're working with, they didn't necessarily grow up with formal exercise like we have. And so that might sound intimidating. Um, or they just might have a false um, assumption of what strength training is. So yes, can you describe a little bit more about what specific types of exercises help increase those proteoglycans in our, in our cartilage. Yes. And so strength training is essentially just any sort of external load. So whether that's, you know, 
any sort of dumbbells. They don't necessarily need to be 20, 30 pound dumbbells. We can start to use, you know, threes, fives, because it's all about for strength training. It's all about where you're at and kind of meeting you where you are. Now, I mean, for me, I, I mean, my strength training will compromise of, you know, 30, 50 pounds, like a lot heavier, but we're meeting you where you are. And if your five pound dumbbells feel like they're 50 pounds, then that's a place that we can start. And so strength training is honestly just adding external load and we have to do it. So with arthritis, it gets a little, it gets a little blurry because we have to make sure that you can move without pain first, without any weight. Then we progress to strength training. So it's not necessarily, you know, go pick up those 10 pound weights and do a squat when you can't even do a squat without pain. And so a big thing with the loading aspect. And so if we do loading first with body weight and then add weight, then people are a lot more successful because if I were to, if you were having say knee pain and I asked you to do a squat, or go up and down the stairs, likely you would have pain with either one of those because those are common movements that people have pain with. But we have to first build that confidence that you can do those movements without pain. So if we take the squat, for example, first we add support, like using a kitchen counter to hang on to and then do a squat because a lot of it is just we're not squatting with the right mechanics. So if we can change those, it makes a huge difference. And so that's one of them. And then we kind of work to, okay, maybe you're squatting to a chair and then standing back up. And so that's another progression. And then you can kind of progress to squatting, just standing there without any support. And then that's when we can start to add weight. You can add weight to the other two. So I add weight a lot of times to a um, chair squat, because a lot of times if you can do a chair squat with extra weight, then that translates to you can do a squat without the chair and without any support holding your body weight. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a progression of, and that's why seeking out a movement expert, seeking out a physical therapist is definitely going to help at least get you started. So you kind of understand how to progress through these things. Another thing I like to use, especially if people have had pain for a long time or really having a hard time finding exercise that doesn't flare up pain. TRX bands or the body weight suspension training has made a huge difference. And so we can put a link below to one of my YouTube videos that just shows you how to use it or shows you some example exercises because that it's like 60 or $70 to get these straps. You can easily use them in your home and you can do so, so much with them that I found a lot of clients who are really hesitant to move or really hesitant to exercise have had tremendous success with these. And so that is another thing that I always recommend to people, but it's just moving without pain. So if that's first, just doing some simple body weight exercises, great. And then we can progress to that strength training, but I don't want you to automatically start strength training, start to have a significant increase in pain and then just get frustrated and then just give up. Yeah, and I, I always start with my clients when I was going to the gym with them, we always started, I would show them the movement because for a lot of older adults, a squat is like, what the heck is that? You know, that's like right. to do some fancy dive or gymnastics move. So um, if there's any therapists out there watching, wondering how you can better serve older adults, show them and explain to them first and then explain your expectations because they might have that expectation that this is just going to, it's supposed to hurt because everything yes. I do hurts. And yes. so explaining what you want from your patients ahead of time, what feedback you want them to give you as the therapist is really helpful. And I absolutely, I've never seen the TRX bands. And I hope that my dad's not watching because I'm going to get him those for Christmas. But here's the deal because, um, his mobility has slowed down and, and he's slowed down, but I do believe that he kind of buys into that myth that, um, he has to like rest for it to yeah. get better. And I'm like, what are you, you know, that's just, it's really, really hard. I think to convince people otherwise and to yes. break that mindset. And so I love the notion of reducing the load, you know, whenever we think about strength training, we think about 
increasing the load, increasing the re resistance. And you are saying sometimes that's too much. Sometimes we have to back off the resistance, take off some of the body weight because yes. then we can move pain free and then we can safely and confidently progress. Now, another thing that you mentioned here that I think is so important to point out is you're talking about functional movements. So we're adding resistance or taking resistance away from movements that people are already doing. So can you tell us a little bit more about your bias towards functional strength training versus isolated joint strength training? Um, let's start there with that question. Yes. So a lot of times functional strength training is honestly just using more muscles at once, because if you think about like climbing up stairs, so doing a step up, you're using your quads, you're using your calves and lower legs, you're using your core, you're using your hips. So you're using a lot of muscles. So if we just do like an isolated exercise, so an example is like sitting and kicking your leg out. So that's working your knee. That doesn't really translate to being good at a step up. So a lot of times people are more um, um, attracted to seated exercises, but in order to get good at these functional movements. So if you think about functional movements or movements that you do daily, so a step up is one of them. A squat is another one. Even walking itself is considered a functional movement. And so in a deadlift, so these, you might not even realize that you're doing these things, but if you want to get good at these, we have to then train for that. So I rarely ever use seated exercises unless you are having like a pain flare up. I have some seated exercises for that, for pain relief specifically. But if you want to actually get better at these things, a lot of times people have pain going down the stairs. And if you want to actually get better at that, we have to work on building single leg strength. We have to work on getting you more confident on one leg and then get you more strength to hold your body weight with one leg, because that's essentially what going up and down the stairs is. So then we have to actually do exercises that are going to do that because seated exercises are not going to get us there because a lot of times people can sit there and do 30, 40 and no problem, but we have to get you actually feeling challenged in order to actually build that strength. Because a lot of times I find when people are thinking they're doing exercise programs, but they're compromised of primarily seated exercises or even some standing stuff, but you're standing there and doing 30 to 40 reps of, you know, whatever exercise you're doing. And it, you know, you don't really feel challenged. That's not really building muscle. And that's not really building the support that our joints need. So we have to make sure that it's challenging as well. And so we focus primarily on these functional movements, squatting, deadlifting, which is essentially bending over, which if you have low back pain, that usually doesn't feel great for you. And so we work on these things because th those are the things that you actually need to do. I mean, you don't need to do anything crazy as far as, you know, pulling up weights and doing all these crazy movements. You just have to be able to do these functional movements. And so that's kind of what we primarily work on. And also balance is to me is considered a functional movement. And a lot of times people think, Oh, my balance is okay. I'm not like falling over or anything, but higher level balance, you would be surprised at how, and I do have a YouTube video on this too, that running through these five exercises, you would be surprised at how different maybe your balance is side to side if you have pain on one side compared to the other. And so that is something I delve very deeply into as well, because if you can improve your balance, which is essentially like if you're standing on one leg, all of your muscles are working at once. And if your balance is poor, then those muscles don't really know how to work together. And so that can lead to pain as well. And so I delve very deeply into that as well. About flexibility because when I think of balance I mean obviously there's the vestibular system there's the visual system there's proprioception strength is super important for balance I think flexibility is as well so do you focus on any flexibility with your programming I do a little bit so I what I found is that with flexibility or mobility it tends to improve with 
exercise. Mm -hmm. So when you start putting your body through these movements that you might not have done in a while or might not have used these muscles, then your flexibility does improve. Because what I tell people is a lot of times when your muscles feel tight, a lot of times it's because you have a weakness somewhere else. And these muscles are really trying to just hold on. They're either going to be strong or tight because both of those are going to help with stability. So if your muscle is tight, a lot of times just doing a stretch, you know, standing there or sitting there isn't necessarily going to be as effective as getting up and moving and actually using those muscles. So I don't do a ton of stretching or anything per se. The only time I do recommend that is like in the morning to get blood flow going, working through a little bit of stretching and mobility to help loosen your joints throughout the rest of the day. But most of the time, I typically just tend to use movement to improve mobility. Okay. And you did kind of mention like 20 to 30 reps, obviously we're not going to see a strength training benefit. So what's your ideal number of reps that a client's performing so that you know that they're working hard enough? Because I think that's a really common question that I know therapists ask a lot is how do I know that I'm pushing somebody hard enough, but not too hard? So this can be a few different things. So a lot of times it's not necessarily a set number. Like if I can do 10 of these, that's going to build me strength sort of thing. A lot of times it's a range because it's different for everyone. Everyone is at a different point in their training. And so usually the range is about eight to 15, but you also want to think about So you want that, first off, you want that exercise to be challenging enough that you're hitting that difficulty level between eight and 15 reps. Another thing you can think about that's really kind of easy. And I ask these, I ask my clients this all the time is if you think about exercise difficulty zero to 10. So there is a scale called the RPE scale that I'm sure you're familiar with that you can look up online. Rate of perceived exertion, RPE. Yes. That's what that means. So the RPE scale, if you type that into Google, you will see a lot of colored scales that are zero to 10 in images. When you do an exercise or when you do a workout, if you think about rating it on that scale, zero to 10. And I like this because like I said, my eight, nine or 10 rating of difficulty might be different than even your rating of eight, nine, 10. And so- (laughs) And so I really like this because then you kind of reflect and say, if you finished, you know, five exercises and then you think about, okay, how difficult was this on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the most difficult. And then if you say, okay, maybe that was a three or four, then you can increase that intensity and make it a little bit more challenging. That sweet spot is kind of between five and eight. And so I always ask my clients after we finish a workout, okay, what was that on a scale of zero to 10? And if people are saying like six, seven, that's great. If we're kind of that two to three, that means we need to make these exercises harder. Not because I want to see you struggle and I want to see you, you know, have difficulty doing these exercises, that's where you're going to see the benefit. Like I said, if we're just kind of going through some things and it's a level three out of 10 difficulty, that's not really building the strength and support we need. I want to see you succeed. And the most, the most of my clients that have success are in, are usually in that five to eight range. And so if you haven't been seeing success, maybe your exercises just aren't intense enough. But then I don't want you to go out and, you know, try these super intense movements, but they have to be appropriate for you. But like I said, that intensity is different for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's not a end all be all, oh, this exercise is usually an eight out of 10 difficulty. My eight out of 10 is going to be different than everyone else's eight out of 10. And so it's, I like it because it personalizes it to you and it's kind of a subjective type thing but it definitely helps give some perspective on, okay, am I exercising hard enough to get the results that I need? Mm-hmm. And I think that's, it's so, so important. And I, I honestly didn't even apply these exercise principles to myself until several years ago. And I think that we learn about this stuff in school and as healthcare providers, we really have to look inside and say, am I following what I'm teaching? Right. Right. Teaching? 
And once I started practicing, you know, what we were taught, I saw great results. And I used to be a crap cardio kind of girl. I call it crap cardio where I would go and I would run. I still, I mean, I don't run a lot after kids, but I will get back to it because I love it. I love that physical challenge, the mental challenge. But once I stopped um, compromising my time strength training with aerobics, with crap cardio, like cycling, I like walking for stress relief. I think that that's good and overall mobility. Um, but when you have children, your time is not your own. And I was like, okay, I have to prioritize strength training here because that is the most important. And I try so hard to, to get that through to my clients and my members is if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to improve your metabolism, if you're trying to reduce pain and improve your function, you can't sacrifice those at least two days of high, moderate to high intensity functional strength training, like Alyssa has been talking about with another walk or with another half hour on the elliptical to burn calories. Okay. We cannot, we have to stop thinking about burning calories and we have to start focusing on function and longevity. So I love that. I don't know. I just feel like you're very, very good at what you do. You're putting so much good information out there. Now I know that people, um, we've been talking a lot about what you do once you have osteoarthritis and some myths, and we can dive a little bit further into that, but do you have any tips to prevent it? You know, what if people, um, maybe they have a family history of it, um, and they're worried about getting it. Maybe they have some joint pain or joint stiffness, but not an official OA diagnosis. What are your tips to help prevent osteoarthritis? So one of the biggest things is don't take a backseat to it actually take action. And it seems so simple, but it's so missed. So for example, genetics, like I said, we obviously can't have much control over our genetics. And so if you have arthritis that runs in your family, odds are pretty high that you will get some degree of it. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have this debilitating arthritis that you just can't do anything. If you can take action early, control your diet, control your weight, really find a movement that you like and that you can some physical activity that you can continue because consistency is key with all of it. Then your arthritis is going to be less severe that I know so many people who are living with arthritis that aren't limited at all, that they don't have any, they may have a little bit of discomfort here and there, but most of the time they aren't limited just because you have arthritis doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to be able to do anything or you're going to have pain all the time. But if we think about that, and if you think about, you know, genetics, Oh, I'm just going to get arthritis. There's really nothing I can do about it. And then you just kind of go on about your daily life. Then, I mean, it's going to get worse and it's going to progress. But if we can do these things and honestly, movement and diet is two of the most important things because they're things we can control and they have a huge impact on our cartilage, on our pain levels, on our just arthritis in general. And so if making those consistent and appropriate are really going to help manage pain. So I just don't want people to think about in genetics, like I said, is the biggest one that, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. It runs in my family. Well, there is something you can do about it. And especially now that we have a lot more research on it. So a lot of times our grandparents or parents or anyone who you know that has had a diagnosis of arthritis for a long time, this wasn't really known probably when they were diagnosed. And so many times people just kind of went about their lives. They didn't really know what to do to prevent it, what to do to manage the pain. And so that's kind of why I think we're seeing a lot of increase in joint replacements now, because that knowledge wasn't really there then, but now it is. And so that's why we need to really take into account, really look at yourself and think about your diet. Think about how much you're moving. Think about your weight. And are you where you need to be? And if you don't know where you need to be, then seeking out help from both of us is definitely important because you have to take action. If you just take a backseat and say, you know, again, there's nothing I can do about it. I'm just going to, you know, pain is going to come no matter what, then 
you're going to continue eating crappy foods. You're going to continue decreasing your activity, continue gaining weight. And your pain is just going to keep getting more severe because the thing of it is we have to start building these habits early because the earlier we start to build these, the more repetitions we get and the more our joints are going to appreciate it. Now, I think when I think of inflammation from a weight loss standpoint, I also think of stress management and sleep because when you're stressed or um, you're sleep deprived chronically, that's going to raise your cortisol, which will increase inflammation. And so I think when people think, um, oh, I, I, when they have so many mindset blocks about, I'm not willing to change my diet, I'm not willing to start exercising. So it's like, well, what are you willing to do? Are you willing to try to get more restful sleep? Are you yeah. willing to try to re reduce your stress? And so I think that that's one of the most challenging things in my professional career is knowing the information that will help people, but communicating it in a way that's compelling them to take action. And I think, I don't know if you run into this, but sometimes I just like want to beat my head against a wall when people just aren't doing what they need to do. And it's like, I don't know what else I can, I can't do anything else for you. You have to do it for you. And Absolutely. do you have any tips there for myself? Cause I'm always looking out for more tips to how do we motivate people? How do we compel them and convince them that they have to take consistent action? Otherwise their health will decline. And it is a guarantee. Yes. And I mean, that's one of those things that you have to be willing to help yourself. I mean, we both really want to see you succeed. We both really enjoy helping people, which is why we got into physical therapy in the first place. But you have to be willing to help yourself. We can only do so much. We can't exercise for you. We can't eat for you. You have to be willing to do it yourself. And one of the ways that I've honestly found that people succeed the most is when they have skin in the game or when they're doing self-pay. A lot of times, if your insurance is paying for something, it's envisioned as being free and we don't take it as seriously. And if you are, I mean, if you think about, you know, something that you've done where you've actually paid for and then actually used or were more adherent to it or more inclined to do something because you paid for it versus something that you envision as being free and then, you know just kind of take it with a grain of salt and don't take it too seriously. And so I know that we both are self pay and I have seen so much more confidence, so much more adherence. People are much more compliant with doing a program. I have actually I have one gentleman right now who hadn't worked out in a long time, had gained some weight, had been having some back pain and some knee pain that just wasn't going away. He has a desk job or has been working at home. And so he really took an initiative to get into shape. And so I've been working with him on knee, knee pain, back pain. We've been working on lots of other things and he has worked out every day for the past two months and is seeing amazing results, but you just have to be willing to commit to it. And a lot of times if you do, you know, pay for it out of pocket, people tend to do better because you just take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing I'm not saying you need to go spend, you know, all this money on all these coaches and things, just find someone that you trust and really just kind of go all in. There's no, I mean, if you're half in, oh, I'll try it a couple days a week or I'll try it maybe once and then go all in because that's when you're going to see the most benefits. The people that I've seen, you know, once or twice kind of wishy-washy don't see as great of results. No. Yeah. And so that's when we really start to see differences between the people that are successful, especially long-term and the people that aren't is because we have to go all in. You have to commit. And that's one of the biggest things. Like I said, we can't do these things for you as much as I would like to wave a magic wand and things would be much better, but you have to be willing to put in the work, but the results are so, so worth it. Now, I, I think it's important to note that the end of the year is coming up and I've been out of traditional insurance, physical therapy for a while but am I remembering correctly that joint replacements go up at the end of the year because people haven't reached their deductible and they want to get the most out of their insurance. 
So yes. with that in mind, people considering joint replacements more, what is your criteria for when you would actually recommend somebody get a joint replacement? Because obvious, I always say pills and surgery is never where we should start or stop with pain management. So what's your personal criteria? If someone was coming to you, what would you encourage them to try first before committing to a joint replacement or a back yeah. surgery? This is a great question because I actually have a YouTube video on this as well. Um, that kind of runs through this criteria. The hard part is there's not necessarily, you know, three boxes you check off, you need a joint replacement. Um, but it's a kind of a lot more complicated than that. Now, um, first off, you're thinking about pain. Is it truly limiting your quality of life? If you just have knee pain or back pain, that's just kind of annoying. Um, it's a little bit uncomfortable and maybe you can't, you know, go work out like you used to, or go, you know, pick up a million pounds like you used to, or something, something that's higher level. This is one thing that I, a lot of people think when they have pain that just doesn't seem to go away and they haven't really done much besides medications, that surgery is the easy way out. If you don't take control of your pain before surgery, as best you can, now I realize there are certain circumstances and certain situations where pain is just uncontrolled and arthritis is so severe. But if you don't take control of that and you don't understand the amount of movement and the amount of lifestyle changes you have to make with a surgery, if you go through a surgery and I've seen this countless times, it doesn't relieve your pain. You still have pain. You still are limited in doing things, but you just have a artificial knee now. And I mean, a lot of times people think when you get a surgery, it's the end all be all. I'm not going to have pain anymore. But those are typically the people who didn't know the recovery was so extensive. And so if you, you have to make a promise to yourself that once you get a joint replacement, you're going to change your behaviors. So if you were pretty sedentary before because of pain, it was hard to move. So you kind of decreased your activity then you get a surgery. If you're going to go back to that, you know, sedentary lifestyle, you're not going to be moving very much. You're not going to see the results that you want to out of the joint replacement. You have to make an effort to say, okay, once I get this new knee, think about what is going to change. What am I going to do more of without my pain? If I could get my pain to go away, would I exercise more? Would I move more? Would I eat differently? those sorts of things, because a joint replacement isn't a guarantee that pain is going to be gone. And so we have to really think about, are you committed to going through the recovery? The recovery is about three months, three to four months <clears throat> until you can kind of get back to your normal life. And then it kind of continues from there, but it's like physical therapy every day, doing exercises three to four times a day to get your mobility back. And so it is an intensive recovery. And so you have to commit to that. And then you also have to commit to moving more, changing your habits after surgery. And I'm not here to demonize surgery. There are definitely times and places where surgery is successful and where people truly do need it. I think that the problem is a lot of times we get into that premature surgery. So if you think about is pain truly limiting your quality of life? Are you going to change your habits once you have surgery? And then also, I mean, are you just committed to the long term of maintaining these habits? It's not something you're going to do for eight weeks and then you can kind of go back to what you were doing. And so it's kind of, and obviously cost plays into it too. Not only the surgery itself, but the physical therapy after, if you have any co-pays or if you're going to pay someone privately, the, all the equipment you might need, like a raised toilet seat, um, you might need a modification to your bed, like a bed rail or something. So there's definitely a shower chair. There's definitely equipment associated. Most of the time insurance will pay for some of it, but they may not pay for all of it. Um, so it is, you know, an expensive process, the follow-up appointments afterwards. So it definitely is an expense as well. And so if you don't think that you're going to change your habits, you don't think you're going to you know, continue to increase your movement afterwards, then it might not be worth it for you. 
But another one is just making sure you've given the effort to conservative management. And I'm not saying that if you get surgery, then you haven't given a good effort to conservative management. It doesn't work for everyone. Now, conservative management is exercise, diet, weight loss, the things that we were talking about. And so if you haven't given a solid effort to that, and not saying you went to physical therapy twice, you had more pain afterwards. And so you've tried physical therapy. It's you've given a consistent effort of, you know, six to eight weeks, whatever it may be. And you just aren't seeing relief. And you've given a consistent effort to increasing your movement during the day, because stiffness is a big problem with arthritis. And then you haven't given a good look at your diet and started to make some small changes and really started weight loss. If you've tried those three things very, very adequately, and you just still aren't getting relief, then surgery may be the option for you. But if you haven't, and then you're just going right into surgery, you might not see those optimal results like I was talking about, because you have to be serious about the recovery. I like to think of the ROI. So if your typical deductible is 10,000, and then you're going to have a copay for physical therapy afterwards, and you're going to have some private costs for equipment, what would happen if you spent $10,000 on getting healthy? Now, I'm not talking fake food plans. I'm talking about <laughs> investing in your education, investing maybe in a therapist or a personal trainer. Um, investing in equipment that you need, like the TRX bands. Can you imagine if people viewed getting and staying healthy as that type of investment, you know, and they were using their healthcare dollars instead of paying to be sick, they were paying to be healthy. Right. Oh my God. It's is huge. Yes. And that is a big kind of mindset shift that we need to do as a healthcare um, system in general. I mean, it's been so reactive, like you have pain, so you have surgery, but what if you had pain and then instead went the weight loss movement diet route. And I mean, you, I mean, you would see so many less surgeries and so many less, you know, pain pill prescriptions, all of these things, there's been extensive research that all this stuff helps. Yeah. Weight and loss movement. I think that people think that surgery is the easy way out. Yes. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Surgery sucks and surgery. Yeah. Is hard. And whenever I, when I worked in this skilled nursing facility, um, and people would come in with a total knee or a total hip and I would look them straight in the eye and I, I'd say, did anybody tell you that surgery really sucks and this is going to hurt like hell? And they're like, no. And I'm like, I'm telling you right now, this is the yeah. And I would have people bring their rosaries to, to therapy while I would like work on their range of motion. And, and I think that there's just myths circulating and the yes. wrong. and people put so much, I'm not dissing on doctors at all, but people just, I think that put so much trust and faith in, um, surgeon, surgeons, you know, whereas like you have to learn how to advocate for yourself. Yes. And, have to give these conservative measures a try, even if you end up having surgery, you're still going to have to do this. So why not try doing it first and save a lot of pain and time and energy and money going through surgery, which by the way, increases your risks for complications like mm -hmm. clots in your legs and your lungs, surgical failure, where you have to go for another surgery. Um, I, I just, there's so many things, um, compensatory. Yeah, I, say, I have lots of horror stories of knee, I, yes. knee and hip replacements, yeah. but I know someone, I heard this, um, from one of the um, doctors I was talking with is the only surgery that doesn't have risks is the one that you don't have. So, I mean, I had lots of patients who had infections. I had one woman who had to have four knee replacements in the span of two years because of infections. Um, I, I had a few people that have had a previous history of blood clots. And so I'm not trying to, we're not trying to scare you necessarily, but you have to think about the risks too. Are the risks worth the benefit? You're only going to get the benefit if you work towards it. So yeah. yeah, you can't just get a surgery, wake up and think that you're not going to have any pain. You're going to have more pain after surgery. Yes. Than you did before surgery. And that's, yes. that's going to be the trend for a few weeks, if not months. Um, and then you still have to, like Alyssa said, you absolutely lifestyle changes. And um, so with that being said, any other tips for people who have osteoarthritis or who are looking to get joint replacements that you wanted to share with us today, 
Um, I, I think that if you're going to have the surgery, we want to get as optimal outcomes as possible. So let's say that they gave the weight loss, the nutrition, the movement, they gave it a consistent effort for six to eight weeks. And they're still in pain that's um, not only impeding their quality of like their movement, but it's really impacting their quality of life. And they're, they decide, okay, I'm going to get surgery, but I want to set myself up for success. So what should my mindset be going into surgery? And how can I prepare myself and honestly, the ones around me, because you need a support system after surgery. So how can I prepare to get optimal outcomes from the surgery that I truly do need? Yes. So I actually have a couple of YouTube videos on this too. Um, the stronger you go into surgery, the stronger you come out. So just because, so say your surgery is scheduled for three months out or two months out, that doesn't mean you can just kind of lay around and rest until then. There are exercises you can do. And that's when some of the seated things come into play. That's when you want to keep your range of motion. Because if your range of motion kind of sucks going into surgery, it's going to kind of suck coming out. And range of motion is one of the biggest things. So bending and straightening your knee for a knee replacement, hip replacements tend to be a little bit easier. But if you can build your hip muscles to be stronger before you go into surgery, your recovery is going to be 1000 times better. And I used to see people after total knee and hip replacements in home care, like the next day. And they would all, and the people that had the most success and the less pain were the people that said, I was doing these exercises before surgery. And now we're kind of running through the same things and progressing. So definitely the stronger you go in, the stronger you go out. Don't think about the interim between when you scheduled surgery to when you're getting it to, you know, just kind of lay around and relax. It definitely, you definitely have to be doing something. And then like you said, a support system is huge. I would at least find one to two people. A lot of times what people did is if they have a couple of family members that live close by, usually about the first week to about week and a half, you want someone there, not necessarily because, you know, you're not safe to be home, um, especially, you know, day five, six, seven, when you're moving a little bit better, but so you don't overdo it because if you're the only one there, you have to cook, you have to, you know, clean, you have to do laundry, you have to do all of those things. But if you have someone there, they can help with that. So it's not that they need to be there to help you every inch that you move, but help with some daily things. So a lot of times if people have a couple of family members, they would kind of stop in and out. They would kind of do like shifts where someone would stay for a couple hours and the next person would come kind of thing. Um, so I would definitely just make sure you have some sort of support system. Or if you don't, I would see if you could maybe get some prepared meals, if you could kind of plan, because a lot of times people might not have family close by. And so get some prepared meals, really kind of set your bed in the first floor if your house is two floors, um, or maybe sleep on the couch, sleep in a recliner, um, those sorts of things. So definitely prepare that way if you don't have any family or if you could have a neighbor or something, just kind of stop in. There's lots of things you can do, but just start thinking about it because you don't want to start thinking about it when you get home or when you're in the hospital with a new knee. And you're going to be on probably some pain pills and you're not going to be thinking as clearly anyways. Yes. Okay. It's, it's really, really good. If you can get some prehab is what we call it. Yeah. Um, insurance. I'm, I know we both don't take insurance anyways, but if you want to go to an insurance clinic or something like that, sometimes that they will pay for prehab um, and you'll get some education at the hospital, but some education isn't enough. You actually have to do it. Um, <laughs> so starting yeah. to do those movements ahead of time, I think is helpful because your cognition will be reduced after surgery from the anesthesia and from the, from the new medications. Yeah. So if you can kind of get some muscle memory regarding what exercises you're supposed to do, even, even how to go up and down stairs at home, how your caretaker should guard you if you have stairs, um, how to get, how to use assistive devices. I think that all of that stuff is really helpful to go over before surgery. And then yeah. when you come home, it's just one last, one last thing to worry about. So I really enjoyed our conversation today. I'm, I think that uh, a lot of other physical therapists are going to be enjoying this conversation, whoever tunes in anything else that you wanted to share about, you know, where people can find you or follow you. I know you have a great social media presence trying to get the word out about how we just deal with osteoarthritis in the best way possible. 
Yeah. So my YouTube is um, usually where you're going to find the most information is if you search in the search bar, Alyssa, A-L-Y-S-S-A, Adventure Alive. Most of my videos, you'll see my channel come up. Um, and then also on Instagram, it's at Adventure Alive. I also have that free Facebook group. So if you go into the search bar on Facebook, type in Keeping Your Adventure Alive with Osteoarthritis into the groups, then you'll see that come up as well. Um, and then also um, that's mainly the places you can find me. Also email, if you're interested, it's Alyssa, A-L-Y-S-S-A at keeptheadventurealive.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and your expertise today. I know it's going to help a lot of people. Um, I'm really excited to get that TRX band for my dad and, Yes, and try to go through some of those exercises with them. Um, yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. Be sure if you like this video on YouTube to comment and let us know what you found was the most helpful thing that you heard today. Um, if you have a family member who has osteoarthritis, please share this interview or the video with them. We would really appreciate helping you helping us get the word out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.